So um, I'm going to start uh, with our next topic. And to do that, first of all, I'll do a quick uh, little montage. On the point of intellectual property, it's, it's really important to understand um, sort of what your pick a light strategy that makes sense for your market. Um, we're sort of straddling two different markets, right? So on one side, you have the, the general web 2.0 software industry, which doesn't, um, really it's all about traction. It's not so much about, hey, you have patents that actually make your company better. Um, on the other side, if you look at sort of healthcare, biotech is all about IP. Uh, and, and you know, companies are built and sold for the IP and not necessary because they have traction. In life sciences, especially when you are looking at a novel therapeutic, novel pathway, companion diagnostic right from the get-go, addressing real high unmet medical needs in the uh, cancer field, your IP has to be watertight. We thought about IP and it came up and we thought hard about it early on and decided very purposely to ignore it. Um, it, it, there's definitely IP in what we've built. There's no question that we've built some interesting things there. There's also no question that if there's no business case behind this, then there's no value to the IP. And that would only slow us down to file it and only cost us precious capital early on to file it. I feel like patents definitely are necessary in order to get any financing, for sure. <laughs> you have to have protectable patents. We are well aware that large companies, when they do partnerships or patented licensings with small companies, will be spooked or will walk away if there has not been a freedom to operate analysis done in that area. So believe it or not, over the past 18 months, we have reviewed 1,600 patents in our part-time with the two founding scientist professors, myself and our, our patent agent, and we made sure that in certain areas we had freedom to operate. You have to be very, very disciplined about uh, what can I file now, what can't I file now, maybe capital is the reason. And maybe I cannot talk about that right now. I put it into my black book, date it, and I wait till I raise capital and take it down to a good IP firm. So the second phase of our intellectual property development was to hire um, the best attorneys that we could find in Silicon Valley with a lot of experience in life sciences. So we've racked up hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees and haven't paid anything yet until we really um, are further down the road. So they've taken a risk on us, and that's sort of the magic of Silicon Valley. Attorneys, big attorneys will take risks on small companies because they expect at some point to get a payout, um, and it's worth the risk, and it's exciting. We approach IP along two fronts. Uh, the first front is filing early and often. So uh, I believe heavily in the provisional filing process. Uh, we file regular provisionals with the U.S. Patent Office. Second we pursue the PCT route. So we do not go to national filings after provisionals. We file then a subsequent PCT application, which buys us a placeholder in myriad geographies and will allow us then to select the geographies that are important down the road. The big benefit there is it offsets cost. When we really look at everything as layers of an onion and thinking about everything from composition of matter to the target to methods of use, but really trying to create something that is intricate enough and complementary enough that it's not any one single piece of this that is the protection, but how all those pieces come together. So IP is one of the most difficult, challenging, frustrating things I have to deal with. It's such a complicated process not just the filing of patents and so on and so forth, but, but really understanding uh, the ecosystem of that particular patent and the number of other patents that are out there and the fact that patents are by no means clear, ever. I can't think of a single patent that we have that uh, people haven't said, oh yeah, but they could get around that in this way, and that we haven't said the same about their patents. Our um, moderator and speaker um, is Jeffrey Shocks. He's uh, the founder of a boutique firm in, in, in Stanford, Palo Alto region, called Shocks Patent Group. He has 15 uh, years of experience, has filed over 500 patents. Obviously, he has a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of experience and teaches at Stanford Law. But the reason I've asked Jeffrey to come and join us today is because he has an amazing ability to talk about a very complex topic in a way that is compelling and engaging. I've, I've seen many folks talk about IP and it's usually very dry and boring. And he, somehow he's able to convey, uh, bring clarity to a topic that's very complex. So uh, please join me in welcoming Jeff. Thank you. I think Dominique um, set the expectation pretty high. I'm gonna have to pull off all of these chairs and tables and do a little dance and another routine um, to keep you entertained this morning. 
The, the topic is a fairly dry one. It's, it's patent law and it's patent law strategy and, and what do we need to be thinking about um, with respect to uh, patent law. My background is mechanical and electrical and software. It's not um, bio and it's not pharma. And so I'll be speaking to about three quarters of you um, today. I'll be obviously touching on um, all of them, but I'm not going to be hitting the therapeutics in particularly hard because that's not particularly my background. I don't think you're going to find anyone that has that particular range that goes all the way through. Um, but that's, we'll be able to hit a decent number of those topics uh, through our panel later today. I'm going to talk about three major topics. Um, deconstructing the, the biggest myth. Um, and with that, I'm going to be asking you guys to actually be voting and or answering questions. And that's what that little clicker is in front of you. I'll talk about uh, building a patent portfolio. And then I'll finish up with avoiding infringement. We're going to jump right into it and ask a, uh, a question. And here on the left is, is Edison's uh, famous light bulb patent. This is one of our greatest American inventors and one of our greatest American um, inventions. On the right is Pipkin. Pipkin came up with an amazing invention. It was the frosted light bulb. Most of the light bulbs in this room are frosted. Most of the light bulbs in your house are frosted. Most of the light bulbs in your office building are frosted. It was a great invention. Who can actually make a frosted light bulb? Edison, he has a patent on the light bulb. Pipkin, he has a patent on the frosted light bulb. Both of them, they can make it because they both have patents, or neither. I'll give you another 10 seconds to, to vote. The poll is closed. And fantastic, you guys have done an amazing job. The answer is D, neither Pipkin nor Edison. And the vast majority of you have actually answered that. I'm pointing out the other two sections, though. Roughly 35% um, of you, greater than a third, they got the wrong answer. This is incredibly important. This is the foundation of patent law. You need to be able to understand this. And this is particularly confusing. Let's talk about this. Edison, the light bulb, an amazing, amazing invention. I mean, this is literally the, the analogy. This is the, the graphic. This is the clip art. When you go and type in invention, you get the light bulb. And so this is how big that particular invention is. Pipkin came along and built on top of that. He created a frosted light bulb. And building on top of, of Edison, um, he laid his rights. When you look down upon this, these two circles, you'll see this black circle, um, the ring that Edison has. And then you also see the smaller one that Pipkin has. To actually make a frosted light bulb, you need to be standing in the middle of that green circle. You need to be there and to somehow get inside that, in this, inside these two fence areas. Edison has the black key to that black gate. And he could just walk right in. But he's going to stop at that green gate. He doesn't have a key to get into that fence. Pipkin, on the other hand, he has the rights to get inside that green key, that green fence, but he can't even get inside the black fence. You actually have to have both of those keys to get inside there. What happens here? I usually have the, my iPhone in my pocket, and I usually pull it out at this point. Um, but I will, at this point, say um, the iPhones or the Androids the phones that are sitting in your pocket or purse right now. How many patents are on that? Is it one? Is it 10? Hundred? Thousands? It's estimated that somewhere between five and 10,000 patents are on that particular device that most of us have in our pocket. It's not too different from this, except on a very, very grand scale. From the big company point of view, this is mutually assured destruction. I have several hundred patents. You have several hundred patents. We're not going to sue each other most of the time. 
Apple, Samsung, they're getting in a few spats here and there. But generally, the big companies don't sue each other. There's plenty of other companies that are smaller that have gone to them and gone to Apple and said, look, you're infringing our patents. Some of those times, um, Apple fights. Some of the times, Apple buys that company. And other times, Apple has gone and said, all right, we'll take a license. This happens all the time where you have this multiple coverage. It's not, as some people believe, that if you have a patent, you have some kind of exclusive rights. Um, you're the one who could actually both make it and prevent others from actually making it. This is important because when it comes down to actually talking to investors, you need to be able to talk about IP in these two different ways. We had the, uh, in the montage, the, well, we're going to ignore, we made a um, conscious decision to ignore patents. That's fantastic. That's actually only one part of this. It's a conscious decision to ignore the fact that we're going to actually protect it. The problem here is that you can't actually opt out of the second part. You can opt out of saying we don't want to protect our patents, if that's the case, but you can't opt out of the other side. Are we actually going to infringe someone else's patent? This is incredibly important, and I'm speaking to the roughly 37% of you, um, the concept that if you get a patent, that doesn't actually give you the rights to make it. And that you need to be able to go out and actually conduct um, a freedom to operate search and need to understand who is out there and if you're infringing any of those particular rights. These are now, you could probably clearly see, the two different parts, the two different sides of, a, of the patent coin. Building a portfolio, protecting your inventions, and on the other side, um, avoiding infringement. Let's talk a little bit about building a, a patent portfolio. Again, back to your clickers. Why do startups file uh, for a patent? Is this so that we can enforce it uh, against a competitor? So we can increase valuation in an acquisition? To deter patent infringement by a competitor? Or to increase leverage over a partner? And there may be more than one right answer here. Pick the best answer for you. Increased valuation in an acquisition is my favorite answer to this. Um, so that we could actually turn around and be able to say, we are now worth more. This is an asset. We put $40,000 in and we get $1.5 million out. This is something that if you had enough time, you had enough money, and you had enough inventions, you would do this all day long. I want to talk about the other ones really quickly. To enforce against a competitor. I think this is one of the big reasons that large companies file patent applications, to protect their space. But I'll tell you, this doesn't really work all that well in the startup space. It takes years to get a patent. You could speed that up now. There's some processes that you could actually expedite how um, quickly you get a first office action. And so you may be able to get a patent within a year and a half um, if everything goes well. But generally, this process takes two or three years. If you're adding a provisional application onto the front end of that, you're just delaying this process. It could actually take three or four years before you go from provisional filing to actually getting an issued patent. How much does it cost to actually enforce against a competitor? It's estimated at $5 million. Those lawsuits take somewhere about six years. It'll take several full-time employees of your company dedicated to this particular project of this lawsuit. You're not going to enforce it. This isn't why you're actually filing a patent application. I use the analogy often of I am some kind of metal smith and, you, and my clients come to me with this rare earth metal that they found and I hammer this into this big broad sword. And I say, look, look what we've created. You know, we could chop down giants with this thing. But the problem is the sword's way too heavy for me. It's way too heavy for my startups. And so all we'd really do is we put the sword up on the wall, and we mount it there. It's not that it's worthless. It's just worthless to us. Like, we can't do anything with it. But we could turn around and say, look, acquire this startup, and this can be yours. 
And in your hands, this could actually be pretty valuable. Medtronic, you could go ahead and wield this. J&J, &J, you know what to do with this. We don't. We're a little startup. We can't afford to actually bring this lawsuit. And for those, the roughly 18% you know, of you that have said, hey, it's enforced against a competitor. This is a great NBA answer, but it's not really the answer for a startup. To deter patent infringement lawsuits, and this is one of my favorite answers, my second favorite. Um, one of my clients a few years ago came to me and said, uh, I want you to take me out to lunch. And the tone that he was using was a tone that most clients never use with me. And so it was, sure. And I dropped everything, and we went out to lunch that day. And he was explaining to me, he's like, you know, we spent you know, over $100,000 in legal fees, and I don't understand what this has gotten for my company. And I think that he was struggling in terms of, like, money was running out, and he was lashing out to me. And this was, a, like, again, this was a little odd for me to be going through this, but um, I sat down, and I, I listened to him carefully. And when he was done, I said, you know, there's an 800-pound gorilla that you compete against. And we know we infringe one of their patents. And we're starting to eat their lunch. And we definitely have their attention. And in fact, they're starting to copy some of the features that you have. And I said, why do you think you're still here? Why, why haven't we been sued yet? And he looked and he thought, and then it wasn't long before he realized, like, well, we're still here because if they would have brought the lawsuit against us um, for patent infringement, we would have turned around and sued them for patent infringement. Because they're infringing you know, a couple of the patent applications that we filed, and if those happen to go through, they have a heck of a lot to lose. And at that point, like, they just kind of re he realized, wow, that $100,000 has actually stayed in my company. Like, I'm actually here today. And he turned to me, and, he said, and later at the, um, you know, when we're done with lunch, he's like, I'll pick this up. I got this lunch. <laughs> and I just gave a nice smile on my face. Increased leverage against a partner. Uh, a few years ago with a client, um, Neuro Brain Stimulation uh, Probes, we, uh, we were, they were jumping in bed with a very, very, very large multinational um, company. And we filed eight provisional applications on the day before a joint development agreement was actually signed. Eight provisional applications is a lot. My, my boutique firm's only eight of us. And so to be able to do that was you know, coordinating essentially the entire firm. Um, but we did it. And then it didn't actually come into any type of value until much later. There was a company that was being spun out of that joint development agreement. And my, my client was essentially being pushed out. Um, they weren't going to have rarely, hardly any value in this. Um, they weren't going to see any payout. Um, the way that they, um, this multinational company had saw it was that everything was co-owned. And everything was co-owned after the day that we had actually signed that agreement. But the key here was that they came to my client because of the great technology that they had. And so we spent an enormous amount of time and money filing those provisional applications. And we reminded them at the key time that this is you know, RIP. You do know about this background IP, right? I mean, this is why you came to us. This is why you were excited to work with us in the first place. And when we laid it on the table, it was incredibly clear that they needed every single one of those pieces to actually be able to move on. And the value of the IP that we were bringing and the power that we had in that negotiation jumped from zero to pretty much the strongest guy in the room. And it was just because we had this leverage because of the provisional applications, which turned into full applications later on, one year later. These are the reasons that I file provisional applications and full applications, and this is why we build a patent portfolio. Next question is then, well, what do we patent? Usually the slide um, when I present it is, is actually the two circles up, and then there's another one. Um, but the one on the left actually represents the CEO, and the one on the right is the CTO. And for this crowd, I decided to make this horizontal. I didn't want to have any kind of hierarchy here. Um, the CTO or the CSO. And what I'd like to think about in terms of like what should we patent? It's what is the actual CEO, what is the CEO pitching? What is she telling an investor to be able to say, this is what's special about our company. 
These are our features. This is, this is what we're going after. This is what makes us unique in this particular space. There's a pitch. You, get, you raise money. And even if you've actually hasn't raised money yet, there's still a pitch there. There's a pitch to your co-founders. There's a pitch to your first um, employees. There's a pitch to your angels. There's something about you that's special. Then turn to the CTO and ask, well, what are some of the technologies that you're proud of? What are some of these things that when you go back home and you're drinking with your buddies, that these are the things that you want to brag about? What are some of the things that you've been pounding your head against the table or the wall for months over, and then you finally figured it out? And then see if there's actually an overlap here. Is there some great technology that's supporting a great feature? A great technology, a great um, innovation, a great invention that's actually supporting something that's incredibly important to the company. These are the things that you should start off with, because this is most likely your core, the core technology that you're going to want to be able to file a couple of provisional applications around. These are the things that you're going to file PCT applications and protect internationally. The problem if you don't kind of take this approach, well, there's a couple of things. I could, I'm up here, I'm a patent attorney, and I could tell you that like, oh, you pick stuff that's novel and unobvious and useful. And none of that's going to mean anything to you. Those are the requirements for a patent. But to tell someone who has a PhD, oh, you know, one of the requirements is that it's non-obvious. Someone who has a PhD who's been beaten down by, you know, their professor for a while, none of their ideas are any good, none of their ideas are actually theirs, it's always their professors. And then to be able to say, like, oh, anything that you've come up with that isn't obvious, that's what we should go ahead and patent. That's not going to work. I haven't seen it work ever. Everything to them is going to be, well, it just came to me, of course it's obvious. There's nothing here that's protectable. And so answering the question, or asking the question of get something that's new and non-obvious isn't going to help. But being able to direct it in this way typically gets right to the core of what, you're, what is your IP. What is your company? What is it built on? Trying to take those features that say this is what makes us unique, and then this is the technology that actually supports that. This is in there, just to kind of give some you know, overview of like, hey, when you start getting into therapeutics, of course, IP is the most important thing there. In software, and I do a decent amount of software outside of the medical space, we actually do a decent amount of patent applications. When you look at some of the patent sales recently, um, AOL, Facebook, App, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Google, it's roughly a million dollars per issued software patent. There's a decent amount there, that there's some importance. When I talk about like an IP and it's purely software company, it's probably number six or number seven on the top ten list. It's not number one. But as you kind of go up through here, digital health, diagnostics, metal devices, and therapeutics, it starts to become more and more important to the point where um, it's not more important than the team and the product. It is the, it is the entire company. And as you go down, back to the left, this is probably now scaling down second most important, third most important, fourth most important. Can we ignore our software patents? I just gave away the punchline a second ago. Um, these things are worth a tremendous amount of money. You put in 30, 40 grand over a couple of years, you get $1.2 million out the door. Can you ignore that? And if you can, then that's great. But if you can't, then you know, this is something that your investors are excited about. This is something that says that, OK, well, we're a technology company. Well, if you're a technology company, then you typically have, right after that part of the story, that we've actually filed for patent applications. And we're protecting our, and building our patent portfolio in this particular way. And we hope to be able to have this type of valuation for our portfolio. This is on the software side. You can imagine a, a factor much greater than this, uh, a number much greater than this on the, um, as you start moving down from medical device um, into therape therapeutics. One of the most important things for a startup venture is being able to scale your patent portfolio and be able to get from this point now, we have very little time and very little money, to a point four, five, six years from now where you want this patent portfolio to be worth somewhere on the order of 10, 15 million dollars. 
And how do you get this? What's that trajectory look like? How do you actually pick patent applications or inventions now that are going to be incredibly valuable four or five years from now? How do you pick ones that are actually going to make it through the patent office? How do you pick ones that people aren't going to be able to design around? This is hard to do. Another thing that we need to keep in mind here is that the law is changing. March of 2013, we're moving to a first to file system. Before we had a first to invent system. Avi in the montage talked about file early and file often. That's exact um, speech that I gave to the biodesign fellows a, a while ago and a few years ago in the, in the boot camp. That this is what we're going to have to move to. Your CTO and your developers, your engineers, your scientists are going to need to learn how to file their own provisionals. It's actually not that hard. I teach this, and it's a class that I teach in, in engineering. I teach at Michigan and at Stanford, and I've taught 500 engineers. This is how you file your own provisional. And in a lecture or two, I could get them to the point where they know nothing about it, to the point where they're filing, uh, where they're writing great provisional applications. This is going to be incredibly important. Uh, March 2013, it's already starting to get greater and greater importance as we get closer and closer to that date. This right here is just kind of some kind of graphic symbol, um, graphic um, around how do you build a portfolio. The lighter circles are provisional applications, the darker ones are full applications. So maybe you're starting off with something of a, you know, moving into your seed round. Maybe you're licensing a patent application from a university and you're filing two provisionals on your own. This is expensive. You could, you could definitely easily budget, you know, five grand each for a provisional and 15 for a full application. We'll talk about in, on the panel um, soon, how do you afford this and what are some of the alternative ways to actually get this and, and be able to budget for this. Moving on, maybe you turn some of these provisional applications into full applications. This is your core right here, these three circles in the middle. And some of these smaller um, circles are to get at some of the features or some of the things that you're doing to kind of extend your technology. These aren't going to be as big. I've had so many clients that after year two or year three, they start to kind of fall off in terms of filing patent applications, which is a little odd. Now you've just raised $15 million and our budget just kind of sank. Why is that? Well, it doesn't feel important anymore. These smaller circles, I put that way on purpose. After you're done inventing the core technology of your company, it's not going to feel like you have huge breakthroughs anymore. You're going to be improving that. You're going to be advancing that, but in smaller ways. But this is still how you build your portfolio. And so that's kind of one of the, one of the things to kind of be aware of of still continuing to push forward uh, after kind of the major breakthroughs have already been made. These ones in red are provisional applications that you're actually going to let go. File early and file often is actually this, the concept, the, the corollary to that is, that is that you're going to file on things that didn't turn out. It actually wasn't decent technology. It wasn't actually all that useful. None of our particular um, end customers even liked it. This needs to be part of your budget, and this needs to be part of your mindset. That sometimes you're going to be filing provisional applications on things that you actually end up going, that you let abandon. One of the nice things about abandoning a provisional application, other than the fact that you spent some time and five grand, um, is the fact that no one is going to know about this. Provisional applications never publish or become um, indexable or, or publicly viewable unless they're actually converted. And so to abandon a provisional application, maybe you did that because it was too early. And you turn around uh, at some point later on and just refile that provisional application. It costs another $125 and that's it. And now you've kind of reset that particular one-year clock. I talk about uh, avoiding infringement. This is the other side of the patent coin. Freedom to operate. This is something that investors ask for um, when you are raising money. Who should be included in a freedom to operate? You should be looking at your direct competitors, all of your competitors, your competitors and all the patent trolls that are out there, or everyone. Go ahead and vote.
go. The trick part of this question was actually, um, what round are we actually raising? And, what's, um, and that makes a big difference to this answer. And that wasn't something that I gave. If you're raising a seed round and you're looking at everyone, then you're probably going to doom your company. I've seen this happen. Because there's most likely a patent or two or three that are out there and what you're doing in just about every single situation. I've never seen a startup that have had absolutely clear freedom to operate. It's not to say that I haven't had successful clients. It's just to say that this is what actually happens. If you're looking at everyone, this is going to be incredibly expensive. So two-thirds of you are probably spending way more money and time than you need to. Early on, who are your, um, the investors are scared about one particular thing. Is there a competitor, a direct competitor, that's going to put us out of business? And that's what you should be focusing on for your seed round. There are 8 million patents out there. You can't look at all 8 million. And even if you could look at all 8 million, there's 5,000 that issue on Tuesday. Another 5,000 that issue the next Tuesday. You can't keep on top of all of this information. And so focusing on, hey, these are our direct competitors for now. And saying to a seed round investor, um, hey, you're looking to invest somewhere on the order of a quarter million or a half a million, and we've looked at all of our direct competitors, and none of them have any patents that we're worried about. That's an incredibly powerful statement. You could turn around and say, we only looked at issued patents. We only looked at U.S. patents. And this is what we do at my firm, and it's worked every single time. Law firms are going to try to say, hey, we need to be able to look at all of these things. It's great. It's great for billable hours. But really, what you need to be focused on is what that seed investor is really, really worried about which is direct competitors. In a little bit larger round, they're worried about all competitors in this particular space. The competitors are the ones that are actually going to sue you. This doesn't mean some guy in Florida that has you know, a, a, some surgeon in Florida that went ahead and tried to do this. You could reach out to them and license it, or reach out to them and buy it if you had enough money. If you found that too early, you're not going to be able to do that because your investor is going to be scared about that especially if you're dealing with unsophisticated investors. You're not going to be able to go to them and say, look, there's a patent out there from this guy in Florida, but if you give me money, then I'm going to turn around and buy that patent and everything's going to work out just fine. That's not, that conversation's not going to go very well. But later on, when you're actually finding this, you could, you could move right through this particular issue, this little um, speed bump. When you're raising a bigger round, you're raising 10 million or 15 million, 20 million, of course you need to be looking at everything that's out there. But this concept right here of scaling your freedom to operate, looking at just the competitors is something that's going to save you a ton of time and a lot of money and particularly some headaches. I want to talk for a second about patent trolls. It doesn't really affect um, the therapeutics and med devices much, but some in the med um, diagnostic space and definitely in the, in the digital health space, I already have clients that um, you know, day one, right after their launch, are getting um, calls by patent trolls. Is this something to worry about? Patent trolls want a licensing fee. They don't want to put you out of business. They don't want to sue you and say, let's take you and shut you down. Patent trolls exist for one reason, to get licensing revenue so that they give it to their investors. Now, if they shut you down, how much licensing revenue are you going to give them? If they shut you down before you've even made anything, how much are you going to give them in damages? Zero. This isn't who you're worried about. Patent trolls shouldn't keep you up at night. If you have a patent troll that's knocking on your door, this is a great thing. That means that they think that you're going to be successful. And you could turn around and hopefully negotiate some license with them earlier than later. Or maybe this is something that you fight. But this is not something that you need to worry about them shutting you down. I'm going to throw one more section up here, and that's selecting a patent attorney. We'll talk a little bit about it on the panel. I'm just going to give you this quick graphic. This graphic represents uh, technology and legal and business. On the legal side, writing claims is, is an art form. It takes a really long time to be able to get good at this. You know, it's a few thousand claims before you actually feel like you're an expert and you're actually doing a great job. So you need to be working with someone who actually has some of that experience. 
Obviously, the technology is incredibly important. Making sure that you work with someone that, that's going to be able to brainstorm and go through the different abstraction layers. You're going to come with them with an invention. They're going to say, that's not an invention, that's a product. I'll show you the invention. The invention's much bigger than this. They're going to help brainstorm with you. They're going to say, well, how could you design around this? How else could we do this? What were some of the other things that you could do? Couldn't you actually do it like this? Couldn't you use these materials? Couldn't you attack it in this particular way? And a good patent attorney is going to be able to do that because they know your technology. As I mentioned earlier on, I don't have a bio or a pharma. Uh, and while some great clients or potential clients have come to me with, um, in those spaces, I've had to turn down every single one of them. I can't do a good job in that space. I don't have the background to be able to brainstorm in that space. And this goes the other way as well. The last one, the last circle there is about uh, is, um, the business side. Grabbing an attorney that's worked with Medtronic for the last 20 years isn't the same thing as working with a startup attorney. This thing needs to scale. I had a client recently that was acquired. And I thought that we were going to be able to work well with that new general counsel. And he sat me down and he's like, you know, we love the patent portfolio. This is why we acquired the company. Um, but the way that you do things is completely wrong. And we don't want to be able to file provisional applications anymore. We don't file PCT applications. We go directly into all the foreign countries that, and we decide this up front, which is exactly opposite of what you would do for a startup. That's not a growing, scaling company. That's essentially just this, you know, it's a company that already knows exactly who it is and where it's going to go. And that's increasing by 5%. And they wait to the last minute to be able to protect their patents, and then they know exactly what decisions they're going to make. That's not what a scalable startup is. So making sure that you actually work with an attorney that has um, scalable startup experience. And with that, which is the end of my presentation, I'd like to invite uh, my panelists up. And we'll do a, a quick panel here for another uh, 20 minutes or so. So we'll go down the line really quickly and just kind of give a um, quick background of um, who you are and why you're here. So I'm Tito Serafini. I'm a founder and CEO of a platform biotech company, a new one named Atreka, otherwise a serial entrepreneur and former academic. My name is Sophie Chow, and uh, I started and sold a company in small molecule therapeutics. And I think uh, the reason why I'm here is to speak on the therapeutic side, small molecule therapeutics, and also because uh, the company I did was a US-China hybrid model, meaning we have to deal with the China aspect of IP. Hi, my name is uh, Anmol Madan. I'm uh, a co-founder and CEO of Chinger.io. We use uh, large amounts of data for mobile phones and build models of a person's health. Hi, I'm Nick Fernando. I'm CEO of Novita Therapeutics, a biologist and an interventional radiologist by training who uh, founded a biotech company developing a protein therapeutic and then partnered that with Novartis and now uh, started a cardiovascular medical device startup. Great. We're going to start off um, just kind of uh, following the last slide that I had of picking an attorney. Um, Sophie, can you talk a little bit about um, how you chose your, your attorney and what were some of the things that you were looking for and what some things that you would look for um, the next time around? Sure. Um, since, as I mentioned, um, I was doing a therapeutics company, small, ther uh, small molecule therapeutics, and uh, as probably uh, many of you know, really the value driver in therapeutics is the uh, NC itself. The targets, the methods, and the screening assays, and maybe some enabling technologies, if you sell that to investors, they will say, okay, add some value, but that's not, that's not the eventual value driver, it's the, uh, it's the eventual NCE. So that's why when I incorporated a company, then I actually went and searched for an attorney that's not only a you know, great attorney, but also has a PhD in chemistry as a background. So I went to Wilson Sansini. That's also partly due to my previous relationship with them. And that, that's where we actually got a really great attorney. And uh, eventually, it, as it turned out, we did just sell the company based on the, uh, the therapeutics patent only, the NCE patent. And uh, during the diligence, of course, the attorney can, not only, can speak not only from a patent perspective, but he, he is a PhD chemist by training. So he can answer questions even from the scientific perspective. And that's very important for us. Awesome. Nick, do you have anything else to, to add on that one? So our, our initial patent for my first startup 
the attorney was selected by the university. So I was the faculty inventor and the university, I was new to that. I went to the tech transfer office, I made a disclosure. Uh, they, they had a patent firm that did a lot of the university's patenting and that person then became my, when I spun the technology out of the university, that became my patent attorney. And about a year and a half in, after the first uh, U.S. Uh, office action, we had a notice of allowance, which I was thrilled about, but a relatively limited disclosure of prior art. And so we took that notice of allowance to a venture capitalist we were talking with, and they said that we should, that they felt there was a better quality attorney, and they recommended another attorney that we should use. And so I went to that new attorney who had a PhD in cardiovascular biology, was a Harvard-trained patent attorney, and a physician, and literally the smartest human being I've ever met. When you talk with him, all of your neurons have to fire all the time, because he is incredibly smart. And he said very bluntly, right up front, you should withdraw your notice of allowance, file an RCE, and make a much broader disclosure and alter your claims. And I was just devastated, because here you are, you know, on the precipice of an issuance, and you get this from a, you go from a poor quality attorney to a good quality attorney who tells you you need to do something that you know you need to do, but, but that is incredibly painful for a startup to do. So we pulled the IP, went with a new attorney, pulled the notice of allowance, wrote an RCE, and the interesting thing is I got a call from my patent attorney, the, the one I fired, and he said, I just want to let you know they're going to charge you a fortune at Penny and Edmonds. And the patent attorney, the patent office examiner is going to be very upset by this. And you're going to have a very hard prosecution going forward because he's granted an allowance. And if you withdraw it before he gives it and file a bunch more prior art, everything he does after that, he's going to be incredibly careful about, which was totally true. So it was three more years till we got a notice of allowance and a new issuance. But now when Novartis came in to do diligence on the partnership agreement, the IP was really strong, and it was because we went from a C player to an A-plus player and spent that time and money and took that sacrifice. So, so it was sort of someone picked one for us, and then we picked our own, and I think it was worth it in the end. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about scaling. Um, so how do we get from something where not only is uh, money uh, constrained, uh, but also time constrained? Um, do you want to start just kind of in terms of, like, how do, how do you get there from uh, from this point to another point? Yeah, yeah that for me. Yeah, um, you know, I, so I can tell you how we're doing it, and I don't know what the the broader answer is. I think this depends on company to company. We are a software company, so we're not we're not in diagnostics or therapeutics. Um, it's for us, it's been sort of being selective about protecting the areas that are. Um, valuable for um, our core business, right? And so there are a couple of areas where it's sort of, it's clear that's where uh, we have novel invention that's going to be a big focus for our business and focusing on that. Um, what we realized though in parallel is it was actually valuable. So we're a new kind of data source uh, which, which can help healthcare. Um, and it's actually valuable for us to have a grassroots movement of researchers and people collecting data and experimenting with the system and just give that away uh, because that community and that traction uh, meant that we would be, ultimately we would be uh, potentially a much bigger business. Uh, and it's, it's you know, merging the sort of traditional biotech view with what happens in software and open source, right? Is uh, Facebook didn't pay a billion dollars for Instagram for IP, they paid for traction. Um, and is, so, so merging those two and finding the right path of like, there's some things which you absolutely have to protect, but then there are others where having a community and traction is much more valuable than potentially blocking people from doing that. Um, that's been something we've experimented with on the scalability side. Awesome. Tito, can you also add to that? Sure, so I think that, I think that uh, what Jeff gave you in his little presentation makes a tremendous amount of sense, and that should be your foundation. But I'm on the biotech side, platform technology, involved in potentially generating therapeutics and diagnostics. And, and I talked a little bit about this in the panel yesterday on funding, that today um, it's very difficult for venture investors to invest in companies like that without a customer already lined up. And so what that means, and has meant for us, is if you need a customer lined up, that customer is very likely looking to you potentially as an acquisition down the road if they're gonna make some investment in launching you. And so what that means is I think the diligence in a sense the, um, has to be ratcheted up a little bit from perhaps the chart that Jeff was showing you. And I think that's particular to um, my industry, my area. 
but for example, we had to do more extensive freedom to operate. I'll tell you right now a little anecdote. Um, sitting on the other side of the table from the global head of business development for a large pharmaceutical company who sort of smiles at me and says, you're just incremental. There's nothing enabling about what you're doing. Knowing that I'd done the freedom to operate, knowing that I had a patent that was going to blow away the industry meant a lot in that discussion. And that discussion is still continuing towards, we hope, a deal. So I do think that the funding imperative changes perhaps how you scale a little bit. Let's talk a, for a second about uh, licensing technology out of a university. Um, Nick, I know you have some experience with that? I did, yeah. I was a faculty member and invented the drug that became my first company. And uh, I was pretty new to IP licensing, pretty new to the whole thing. And I did manage to find what, what really helped me in getting that license agreement done was one, educating myself about the process. And then I was able to find a consultant, an IP consultant, who had just recently left the tech transfer office at the university I was negotiating with. And so I used her as a consultant and a straw, kind of a, a background party. And she advised me on what the process was. And she knew a lot about the process. And she knew a lot about the process at my particular university. And it made the process very efficient. I, clearly got to a, a great place, you know, later when we went through diligence for VC investment and diligence for, you know, for pharma, there was a real amazement that, uh, you know, first time entrepreneur would get such a good deal from a university, but I was a faculty member and I was working with someone who was an insider. So I, we have not had to do any redo of that agreement. It's been through multiple diligence uh, processes. And so I, you know, that, pro that worked really well for me. But if you look at a a billion dollar a year market for a molecule, even a two or three or four percent royalty for a university, it's an enormous amount of money. So they're, you know, they're poised to do very well with this piece of IP that was, you know, maybe they invested twenty thousand dollars of fellowship salary in. So overall, I think I got good terms, but what they saw in me was here's someone who will go make something out of this. They had a piece of IP, it was very early. They had nothing they could do with it. It was too early to license to pharma, and there wasn't anyone but me who was gonna carry it forward. So we made an agreement. You give me a very good deal, and I'll go out there and try to make sure that you get a smaller percentage of a big number. And I, you know, I explicitly made that argument that I'm gonna be committed to this, and they liked that. And the other thing I did, which I regret, is I sacrificed my royalty as an inventor. Because I was a faculty inventor, so I could own the IP and still have a royalty that went through Hopkins and then back to me. And the venture capitalist I was working with said, you know, no double dipping. Um, I want the lowest rate possible at your Series A on your license agreement, and that means you have to give that up. I regret that. I think if I'd have fought harder for that, I might have gotten it. Because even in the end of the day, if your Series D blows up, and you're fully diluted out as a founder, and you still have the royalty and the molecule works, it's, you know, it's an extra way to win. But I don't have that. I, I don't do any um, uh, licensing work, but I often uh, counsel my clients on the kind of the high level points. And that's definitely something that uh, you may have been able to fight hard for and actually uh, won. A um, decent number of my clients spin out of the University of Michigan. And I, rep and I recommend that they use local um, attorneys there to do that particular deal um, and to be able to make sure because they know the University of Michigan Tech Transfer. They go out to lunch with them all the time. They know what they're looking for. And so I think your point about having someone who's local at that university with a ton of experience to be able to negotiate on your behalf or be able to act as your silent partner in that negotiation I think is incredibly valuable. Yeah. Thank you. Tito, do you have um, some experience also with licensing from a university? Right, so rather than talk necessarily about the licensing aspect, focusing on the IP, um, universities cannot invest enough in their IP to do a good job. So they treat it a little bit like a commodity, uh, and I'm sure Jeff has many stories to tell about this. He does university work. We're only spending four grand on this. That's all we're spending. <laughs> Well, you, you get what you pay for. And it's not that the attorneys that universities use can't do a good job. They just can't do a good job with the amount of time they're being told they can spend maximally on the patents. So um, we actually had to 
um, redo things. You know, we actually, and so I would, I would urge you to um, step in. If you can identify technology before a non-provisional has been filed, I would urge you to step in and very quickly uh, convince the technology licensing group there to allow you, because you're the presumptive group that's going to license it, uh, to work. In fact, what we did for this startup was I, there was no way I was going to go through the uh, pain and suffering of launching a startup with crappy foundational IP. And so we convinced uh, the university to allow us at risk, because we had no rights to the IP at that point, to invest our own money in making sure the patent was good. And then they went out and marketed it. And fortunately for us, we were able to obtain an exclusive option to it. And you know we're in the process of licensing it and launching the company. So we took some risk. All of you should be aware of that. But in the end, we got much stronger foundational IP by working with someone like Jeff who, you know, and putting in our own money. Yeah, just to kind of echo that, there's often times where I've actually ghost written the patent applications for the university. Um, Michigan, and to some extent Stanford, have a very strict conflict of interest issue that either you're representing the university or you're representing the startup. You're not representing both. But what, one way around that is to be able to tell the university, we're going to put together a document, an invention disclosure, um, that looks a heck of a lot like a patent. And if you want to use that and have your patent attorney look it over and file it as your own, that's fantastic. And typically, you're not double charged for that. You are charged a little bit for university time, but it's not to the extent that it's a double patent application. And, and what's funny about it is that uh, it takes a little bit of ego swallowing because you're working with somebody really smart and talented, and they'll never appear on the patent at all, and it's their patent that they've written. And the university's attorneys are taking it, looking to make sure the, the, the T's are crossed, I's are dotted, and then just filing it with the US Patent Office with their name on it. Can I say something a little controversial now that we are actually on the uh, academic campus, but when I tried to raise money, we didn't in license any IP from any institutions. Actually, part of the reason is that um, when you look at the cost of uh, patent prosecution, of course, it's a great deal of money. And so therefore, I try to think from a business person's perspective in the sense that you look at this company, what's going to drive value? If it's the NCE, then what you want to do is the increase the potential out, um, potential upside and then limit the potential cost, meaning do not in license any IP. That's not really directly leading to an NCE. So in other words, we didn't in license any technology from academic institutions. We didn't in license any like target or new targets or whatever, even though to do that, it may actually have increased the sexy appeal of our company in front of some certain investors because we were a company raising money with just a business plan and the team with no in license IP from academic institutions. So what I want to say is that you know when you think about IP, it's such a great value driver, but then you want to focus on exactly what your company is going to be perceived. When we went out and sell the therapeutics, no one asked us, oh, do you have any unique technology? Because the only item that people pay attention to is the preclinical candidate because that's the only thing they consider is value driving. So, and then another point is that uh, I think one of the reasons why we didn't license anything from um, academic institutions is because we didn't have the unique relationship with tech transfer office and the professors very, many professors ask for so much because they have spent so much time and energy um, and investment in creating this IP. It's so much that it's impossible to accommodate their demands while facing the investors. And that's why I think aligning expectations and you know, understanding the really, what is the value really is in your IP, that's very important. Just to quickly add to that, um, I, I think, so I come from my lab, again, this is computer science. My lab is, uh, the head of my lab sits on the board of Wikipedia and Mozilla. And so clearly it's all about open source and public domain. And so all the work I did there is actually in the public domain. Um, and we never had to license that either. But that's part of it is sort of not having to deal with a lot of those, those complications. Awesome. I think what we'll do now is uh, open it up for a few questions. Good morning. Um, for, for a small therapeutic company whose initial focus is on the U.S. market, 
Are there, do you guys have any thoughts on how to optimize and pre preserve X US uh, value, sort of the when and where to file, um, for any potential future partners, collaborators, or co-marketing agreements, especially when you have a limited budget? Sure, I'll, I'll kind of toss this to the panel, but just kind of one of the, the quick thoughts that I have on this is to uh, kind of think about your, you know, this is this core. And if this is core to what you're doing, then like, then maybe you can go out and, and get a couple of the big markets with respect to the budget that you have. Uh, filing a PCT, being able to delay those costs until into the future. Filing a, a patent application in the EU. I actually enjoy and, and recommend, strongly enjoy and recommend uh, China. It's a very, very large market. And the IP laws there are changing. And for a long time, um, as public policy, they wanted to have weaker laws to be able to bring in technology and to bring in knowledge. And as they've called up and surpassed us in many ways, um, they're going to just quickly flip the switch. And so um, the kind of controversial answer of filing in China, I think it actually makes a heck of a lot of sense to a decent amount of um, to startups. Because I think that the laws are changing. And if you're dealing with something that has a decent shelf life, on the order of 5, 10, 15, 20 years, the laws are going to be incredibly strong there, easily within that time period. Yeah, we were a small company, and we definitely went through the route that Jeff suggested. So basically, provisional followed by PCT, uh, followed by you know individual country filings. And we tried to delay as much as possible, because indeed, even if your focus is on the US market, but if your drug is so good that someone can actually just do it outside of the US, then you, it would basically kill your US market. And, uh, and then China, of course, is considered one of the fastest growing, <coughs> sorry, fastest growing markets. And uh, um, we actually w followed the, our patent attorney's suggestion. They gave us a graph showing, basically, if you want 90% of the rev pharmaceutical revenue covered in the world, which are the countries, meaning as, fewer, as few countries as possible, how can you cover 90% of the pharmaceutical revenue? And that, of course, includes China and Korea and uh, Taiwan and so on. But then it will eliminate some of the countries, you know, in really small countries. That's to get the, basically, the bang for the buck, meaning you can really, if you want to achieve 100% of the pharmaceutical revenue, you, your patent prosecution fee is going to be enormous. But if you want to just cover more than 90% or more than 95%, it's actually manageable, especially if you can do a um, partnership, hopefully very soon, for ex-USA. And that would also you know, lower your patent prosecution cost. I think a good rule of thumb is for an angel-backed, then the capitalized company to do the US, Canada, Europe, Australia, and Japan. You know, that you can build a business on those markets. You know, if you get a Series A and you're a venture-backed company, then you can add Brazil, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Russia. You know, that's kind of how I break it down. Some are easy, like Hong Kong. You know, so it, they're easy to throw into the first group if you want to do it. That, you know, that, that was kind of the old way to do it in therapeutics. But now, about half of the market for some therapeutics is outside of that first group I gave you. And so if you are going to do a big pharma deal, you know, they like to see more broader IP than maybe a startup can afford. So maybe your first patent has that limited geography, and then your second patent, when you have more capital, is more broadly applied. Morning, yeah. Jeff. And actually, uh, your talk is great, but it scared me now. Uh, my situation is I'm a faculty. I submit three patents already. I have a dance of a patent down the road. I believe is home run patent. Eventually, it will generate a great business down the road. So, uh, you know, the Kansas Medical Center actually is very really thirsty to support, to help me to get patent. Now I realize maybe they will grab my money later. So, my point is, what's the best strategy to deal with that? Should I hide in some core property now, submit patent by myself? or like the Kansas University submit a patent? This is Thank tough. You. I mean, the, the fact when you when you start building your own IP, then you, know, you start having a way to negotiate. Um, this is great core technology that we're spinning out of, the out of the university, but we've actually lined this with a couple of other fences, a couple of other key technology. And now you're able to go back to the university and say, while well, you'd want to have this type of royalty rate, we don't think that it's going to be significant or important or even you know, feasible to do this 
in the field without these key technologies that this outside startup that you're helming um, has, has created and protected. And so to have this kind of balance, I also think that balance is also important for investors. And they see that being able to have that power in negotiation of both, hey, here's some great IP that's coming out of a university, and then here's some other IP that's actually in your startup. So just uh, my, uh, my two cents. I would agree totally with Jeff on that, that what we've done uh, almost immediately because I was able to attract a, a group of very talented people to work on this outside the university is we start, we have filed two provisionals at this point on technology that extends what the university's foundational patent will be providing us. And it's been very attractive for investors, as he said, and also now that we're talking, you know, now that we're negotiating the license, it will allow us to push down on the royalty rate. I have a question. Does anybody in the panel have experience in how to deal with an academician who values his freedom to publish greater than his desires to file for patent applications? Um, have you dealt with that, and how, how do you approach that with, with the academicians? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, was that to me? Yeah, anybody on the panel that's dealt with academic? We're, we have a co-founder. We're, we're dealing with a co-founder who um, really wants to get the company going, but he views patents as the counter to his academic freedom for publications. And, and I'm just curious if anybody's dealt with that, if there, there's any experience of how, how to most effectively my, my one comment before I let them others speak is a comment I made yesterday in a panel, choose your founders very carefully. I'm very sincere about that. If someone cannot be convinced to play the game the way it needs to be played, you just might be wasting your time. And it's, and it's a ill portent for going forward. And just to add to that, I think I think that goes down to so there's ways in startups at our stage for people to play a variety of different roles um, and still be valuable to the company. So maybe and we've done this is maybe that person uh, I've convinced a couple of other PhDs to drop in and be founders where they are sort of working with us uh, on on the actual scientific side of things inside the company. We also have an advisory board or sort of scientific experts who are outside and the roles are very tightly defined and their contracts with the company sort of define exactly what they're doing and how. Um, and but, but you can you can structure compensation for them where maybe uh, you know single digit points of equity or whatever when you're starting off, uh, but which is still very meaningful for the amount of time that they're spending, and maybe that's how you get their value. Uh, but I, I think you have to be it's it's sort of hard to have two um, positions that are part time each because then it becomes hard to distinguish what was done where within the company versus within the scientific institution. I had a quick question about that question. Are, under the new rules, are we still going to have a year after a disclosure that you can file where you have that sort of Yeah, so your, your own bogey? publication will still have a grace period, and it's kind of hard for people to wrap their head around. Yeah. Um, we'll still have a grace period. We're moving a first to file. Sorry, the question, um, as we move to a first to file system, can you actually publish, and then is there still a grace period? And the answer is yes. So we'll still have a grace period here in the United States. Um, the, the grace period is only for the U.S. Yeah. That's incredibly important to understand that. Um, exactly. Yeah. Once you publish, then those international rights are gone. I mean, can you publish as a startup and do that after um, patents have been filed? Yeah. Well, so. and, and let's let's make it clear, it's not just publications, right? It's disclosures that right. your academic co-founder goes and gives a beautiful slide presentation right. somewhere. That's a, that's a horrible prior, prior art issue for you if it hasn't been protected. Yeah, I had a very particular situation like that where for a very brief period, we thought about, we had some extra money, we thought about in-licensing a product from a university professor, and we looked at his publications and they were fine, and then uh, later, he said, right before we were going to sign the deal, which had some upfront money and some pretty good royalties, he said, oh, by the way, I gave a talk at when I got an award <laughs> at my, was inducted into my international society of, I can't remember what it was. And it took us a while to find the videotape. And when we played the videotape, it was over. I mean, it was all of what he had filed on and was going to license to us two years before he had disclosed in this presentation. And he was, he was, 
he was crestfallen. But he had, I think, held that from us until we were ready to get the deal done <laughs> because he knew it would be a problem. And that happens. My co-founder calls these the oh, by the ways, <laughs> which is you're just ready to do a deal and you always have to think, okay, they're coming. The oh, by the ways are coming. The things they didn't want to say until it was right in front of you. Oh, by the way, I gave this talk. Okay, well, that's after we spent $100,000. It's nice to know that. I would have liked to have known that three months ago. So the, the real quick pragmatic answer that I would give is, you know, if this is someone that you, you absolutely have to work with and this is a, an adamant opinion, how do you turn around and t look at this timeline? We're going to raise money in, you know, five months from now. Um, can we delay this uh, particular publication by six months? Can we file a provisional application? Can we slap a cover sheet right on it? It's far less than ideal to do that. I don't recommend that generally just to slap a cover sheet. But if this is something where you're incredibly strapped and you need to be able to get, there's, they're adamant to be able to push this, can you slap a cover sheet on it, file it as a provisional application, and delay it as much as possible? There are some pragmatic ways of dealing with this. Last question. I I have a question about uh, licensing from universities. Uh, a lot of the times with startups, uh, if you have SBIRs, for instance, specifically, uh, you want to do your clinical trials or clinical studies initially, and you're trying to do them at academic institutions with a, a thought leader. Uh, and the issue comes up, uh, how do you do the subcontract deal, and how do you do licensing of the joint IP that comes out, uh, because you have IP previously, and how do you protect your rights? Uh, do you guys have any insight on, on that? So at SBIR, in the SBIR program specifically assigns all IP to the grantee. So you know, if you have an STTR where you have a university partner, you have to have an IP agreement in place before you can file the STTR. So you have to sort that out in advance. I don't know about the R01, R29s, and, and the rest of that. I'm not as familiar with that. but. I'm very familiar with the SBIR program, if, if that was your question. I think there's some other conflict issues that will raise their head potentially. Often these days, a savvy university will take a little bit of equity in your startup. And if you're not careful about the terms, uh, they will force you to sell the equity when you can't uh, if you do a clinical trial at their university. So you need to be very careful about that situation in particular. For example, we're going to, as a matter of course, just never, ever, ever do a clinical trial at the particular university we're licensing our IP from because they've demanded a little bit of equity in the company and as consideration for the license. So again, that's something to be very careful about. And then IP, it's who, in, you know, who invents is the inventor. That's legal. That's legal. That's not a decision that can be negotiated. That's one of the things I was hoping to, to cover but did not, but just the concept of inventorship and be careful who um, is being part of that. You can't decide, you know, like, okay, um, it, it's often kind of thought of as like, oh, I'm the CEO and I'm going to decide like, who's actually going to be on this path. <laughs> um, that's not actually how it works. And so the, the inventors are, from a legal standpoint, who the inventors are. And making sure that whether these are consultants or maybe these are the university folks, making sure that you actually have all of that IP wrapped up is incredibly important. And that actually is one of the hardest hit issues in due diligence later on when you're raising money or being acquired. I had a, a due diligence call. One of my clients was acquired. And we spent something on the order of about 60% of the time um, talking about just making sure all of the consultants, everyone else um, had Loctite employment agreements and IP agreements that go back to the company. Yeah. This is a really, really big issue. You don't want it to be now. Everything's friendly. Everything's great. But this turns out to be an incredibly important issue later on. This has been great. Um, thank you much. This is the end of the panel today. And I think we're taking a break. Thank you.